Okay, so this is Neil. We're here to talk about our visit to Sicily, uh, which we did this last weekend. So Neil, how'd you get your black eye? My black eye. How did I get my black eye? You mean this black eye? That black eye? See if we can make it disappear. Ah, gone. There you go. Actually, what happened was I went to brush my voluminous hair back in my face during the convention, and I jammed my thumb in my eye. I honestly jammed my stupid thumb in my eye. That's how it happened. I'm, I'm innocent of any, doing anything stupid. Well, that, except for that. That's pretty stupid. But there you go. So anyway, we went to uh, Sicily. Why did we go to Sicily? Comic-Con. To a place called Etna. Why is it called Etna-Con? They have a volcano. I kind of wonder about that myself because every couple of dozen years, the place blows up. It doesn't really, you know, destroy the civilization. But the truth of the matter is that it has destroyed the civilization <laughs> a number of times. And it turns out, like, a week before... The convention uh, started, and we were invited, and it was all, everything was kosher and everything. Etna started again. It started to erupt. It's like, I don't know, it's Neil Adams' luck. You may have heard about Neil Adams' luck. It's the worst luck in the world. I can share my bad luck with you if you want to come anywhere near me during a con. It's the worst luck in the world. Marilyn looks at a video, and there it is. Etna's blowing its top. We've got, there probably you can see the video. They, it blew its top. It didn't come down into the city. It's called Catania. So did the volcano interrupt your trip? You, you can't go to Sicily. You gotta go to Sicily from Rome, or you gotta go to Sicily from Istanbul, or Constantinople. You remember Istanbul was, was Constantinople. Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? Nobody's business but the Turks. Anyway, so we had to go to Istanbul, and and we and then we flew. So it was like another four hours. So it was like I don't know, thirteen or fourteen hours. Anyway, so let me just say this about about Istanbul before I say anything about Sicily. They have the greatest airport. They've got you know the duty free area in the in the airport is like the center of the airport. It's like a shopping mall. You go to most airports, you get you get you know Burger King, and you get and you can get the the jewelry and the other stuff, and you can get massages. No, this place was all duty free mall, and then the air the airlines were along the edges, and then they had these little buses that would drive you around, and they had little marks in the floor where the buses go, so you can stay off those marks so you don't get hit by the buses inside the airport, and to go and they did it because if you wanted to go from one end of the airport to the other end of the airport, you had to go like two miles. You know what it did? It threw my mind back to, you know, like in the, in the dark ages and the middle ages, if you wanted to send your kid to, to university in the Western world, in England or Germany or wherever, you couldn't do it. You sent them to an Arab country because those are the only places in the world that actually had universities. We didn't have universities in the Western, what you call the Western world. So they sent their kids to Arab countries, to Damascus and, and Constantinople, which has become Istanbul. So if that's your flight, how was the hotel? The hotel wasn't a hotel. They had, let me just say this, they had a building and it was, and they had broken up the building into different, into different uh, rooms and suites. And they gave us a suite, okay. And it was in an old building that was older than America. Any place in America, this building was older than it. Because it was, it was like, you know, 1300s. So you're in this 1300s year old building, right? And a lot of the stuff was destroyed because, you know, Mount Etna blew its top and so they, you know, fried everything. So they had to rebuild the city a couple times. The people who ran the hotel made a deal with an antiques dealer and the antiques dealer furnished the hotel with antiques. Some of the stuff was really cool. I mean, you'd walk through a portion of the hotel and it would be antiques everywhere from different ages because it was there was no like critical decision as to, oh, it all has to come from the same age, 1400s or 1500s. It was from all these different ages. They had vases, okay? We had two vases in our room from ancient Greece, okay? And so you get this one vase and it's got paintings on it of war. And then you have this other vase sitting right next to it that has paintings on it of sex. 
<laughs> of like, I don't know, dog creatures, weird stuff. And we just. Why, it looks like young men playing leapfrog. Is it Greek? Oh! The weird sex. It, obviously, these things did not go together, or else you couldn't live in the same house. And then they had a painting on the wall of like somebody had taken a done a painting of uh, some of the scenes that were on the uh, on the vases, but they had picked the sex one, right? And so it was these two re naked wrestlers, and there was this big painting on the wall. And I'm looking at the painting. I'm going, wait a second. This was just copied from some vase. It was not a painting from back then because first of all, it would have been cooked, but second of all. It was a painting in Greece and Rome and even in Egypt. They didn't have paintings. There was no canvas. There was no canvas to have paintings on. They put the stuff on the walls. So somebody had copied one of the drawings on one of the vases and put it as a painting on the wall, which was terrible. It was ugly as, as sin. But to decorate the place, they just took this image and put it over there, not realizing, of course, there was no such thing as paintings back in those days. Then there was all these other things, chests, and the, and they had a bed that was it basically looked like it was suspended off the floor. They had attached the bed to the wall, and because you know now we live in 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 apartments and, and hotels that have plasterboard walls. What do you call it? Sheetrock. Huh? Sheetrock. They have sheetrock cardboard. They have sheetrock, and so you couldn't attach anything to the wall. But back in those days, they had cement, so you could attach you know, risers and stuff to the cement. Then they, uh, they had another piece that came out from the middle and then it went into the floor. And then it was metal and wood, big, you know, four by four and metal. But when you looked at the thing, because we had a shiny floor, it looked as if the bed was floating. So it's like, that's not an antique. What is that? That's just a floating bed. So anyway, they, they had us in this wonderful building. And of course, if anybody who's been to Europe knows this, that the elevators in Europe are about, I don't know, two and a half feet by two and a half feet. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> if you put suitcases in there, of course, you put the suitcases in, hit the floor, and they go up there. Then you have to run up the stairs and take the suitcases out because there was no way to go in there with the suitcases. And they were the slowest elevators in the world. I, you couldn't get a slower elevator. You had to hold the button. That's right. You couldn't send your suitcases because you had to hold the button. So you hold the button for three floors and you're standing there for about a half an hour waiting for the elevator to get up there. Then you get out, I'm stupid. But at the same time, fantastic cobblestone streets. We were outside of a place and, and uh, on, on the corner, you, the, it was impossible for the cars to get by. They had fruit stands and outside an outdoor market, like an like old world outdoor market for like five blocks. And so you really couldn't drive your car there. You could come to an intersection and stop there and you can move, go away, but you couldn't go by. And so you buy your fruits and vegetables there, right? And the, the, this is the weirdest thing. Marilyn gets up the first morning and she looks out the window and she sees all these birds flying by. Now these are swifts. I don't know if you know what swifts are, but swifts are very like sharp pointed wings and they go really like this. Shoo, 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 shoo. And there were hundreds of them, hundreds, maybe thousands, okay? They were flying around. What were they doing? They were catching mosquitoes and flies. You can imagine in a fruit market that was blocks long, overnight you'd have the birth of more flies and mosquitoes, okay, after, you know, from the day. And so in the morning you wake up, as the sun comes up, these swifts start flying around, catching these flies and mosquitoes like crazy. And you go, what the hell is going on? And it's these swifts going back and forth. There's a, there's a video. We got the video. We, you, you can see it. It's just incredible. Just incredible. So that's where they, that's where they gave us to, to, to live. And it was terrific. They came, picked us up in the morning and took us to the convention. And there were, uh, of course, there were book publishers there. And there were, uh, the economy is not very good in Sicily. Uh, there was no minimum wage. So there was a lot of very low level in income and some high level income, but of course those guys never came to conventions. Um, and there were artists. One of my favorite uh, Italian artists, Simone Bianchi, who has done some of the best uh, comic book art in the, in the world, but a little off, a little strange, a little exotic, but still quite fantastic. And he's doing a series with Mark Millar called Sharky. And of course it's for Netflix. 
So I've, you know, I was so curious to ask him about what kind of a deal he got, and I was really unable to get to him to find out the deal, to be perfectly honest, but I really did want to know what the deal is, because Netflix just recently bought uh, Mark Millar's kind of catalog, so as they're making stuff, you know, what does the, what does the artist get, what does the writer get, I don't know, and I'm very, very curious, uh, and uh, we didn't quite get to that, and I'm very, very anxious to have heard about that. But he's so entertaining and so much fun, and his Italian well, he's as Italian as you can get. I mean, just laughing all the time and having a great time. Then there was uh, Claudio Castellini. Claudio Castellini, if you guys uh, remember, was an American artist that was sort of the uh, inheritor of the John Buscema style, and he kind of stopped work about 10 years ago. And I was, you know, I didn't consciously miss him, but he, you know, I'm thinking, uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing this Claudio Castellini guy. Apparently he did a book with Marv Wolfman, and he did a book in, in Italy that called Man and Superman with uh, Marv Wolfman. Anyway, his, uh, it's a really nice job. But the, it seems as though there was a delay in putting it out. They, they, had, they had the comic books out. I don't know if they did a combined version, but they also had it out recently. But there seemed to be, because there were buildings blowing up, some question of whether or not it, it was psychologically bad relative to 9-11. So there seemed to be a kind of a negative hit on it. I don't know how the hit worked out because I wasn't really paying attention at the time. But uh, I got to look at the book. He gave me an Italian version, which, of course, I couldn't read. And now I have to get the American version. And I'm calling Diamond and trying to get a hold of copies uh, to see it. But he just did a, a really marvelous job. And right after that, he retired. And he decided to draw um, comics for uh, fans, fan art. So he was there. Now, let me just say this. Good-looking man. Now, I probably have photos, so you probably see him. Good-looking man. He's got a tan that doesn't end. I mean, he smiles, and you can see the tan move to the side of his face, and he shaves his head, and he's all tan on the top of his head. And I, and I said to him, you know, Claudio, uh, I, you know, I've always loved your work, but I what's this retiring thing? He says, um, I go to the beach and I have a good time and I, have, and I do some drawings for people. Uh, I just like it. I said, really? You like the beach more than like drawing? He says, yes, uh, I like drawing. I like and going to the beach. <laughs> and so what do you say to somebody who says that? I, uh, I want to see you draw some more comics, but you know, if you're at the beach having a good time, there's nothing, not much you can say. Oh, Alex Maleev was there. I worked with Alex Maleev on Marilyn. What did I work with Alex Maleev? Yes. I worked with uh, Alex Maleev on um, uh, a music video called Swamp Boogie Queen. If you ever get a chance, you should uh, try to find it somewhere. It's really kind of cool. Uh, it didn't make it. You know, it didn't hit the top 40. Uh, but Alex started the project and brought me into it, and it, it was a whole lot of fun. He did a terrific job. And I hear he's going to be doing Batman. I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't grill him, but we had a nice time. We had a really nice time. Aren't you also doing Batman? Uh, yeah, I am. That's true. I'm doing Batman Ra's al Ghul. I mean, anybody who's read Batman Odyssey gets a funny feeling that there's more to the story. And when you read the six-part Dead Man, you get the feeling that there's a little bit more to the story. Well, when you read Batman Ra's al Ghul, you're going to discover there's a lot more to the story. And I've got my fingers into some heavy stuff here, and I think you might want to take a look at it. It's, uh, it's pretty good. And uh, anyway, so it's really basically a three-part story. So you really have to read the whole thing. So I'm Look, I'm not saying this, but I would suggest you read Batman Odyssey first, you read Dead Man second, and you read this last. But you, you're going to be—it's going to be a kick in the head. It really is going to be a kick in the head. You spoke about in previous videos about how Superman vs. Muhammad Ali was distributed. How was the distribution with Italy with America? Well, that's a, it, see, that's the thing is that for whatever reason, I mean, uh, okay, we're we're talking between ourselves, right? And uh, uh, Europe kind of gets their comic books a year later than we have them here because DC and Marvel have deals with uh, uh, European publishers. And for whatever reason, it, it takes a, a given amount of time, or if that's the part of the deal, I don't exactly know what it is, that a year later the book appears. So, you know, they didn't get Batman Odyssey till a year later. 
they, they're not even, they're just barely getting dead man now. So that they're behind the times, but except for the fans and the fan, geeky fans will get American versions sent to them in the mail and they'll share those with each other just so they can keep up with the story. It also helps them to speak English. Anyway, when Superman versus Muhammad Ali came out, Superman vs. Muhammad Ali saw all the countries that it was distributed, all the free countries of the world, at the same time. Now, logically, if you could get Superman vs. Muhammad Ali out at the same time in all these countries, don't you think you could get your regular issues out at the same time in all these? I don't know why it doesn't happen. And that was before things were digital. It should be even easier now. You than would, th you digital. would think. Now it was an important comic book. God only knows, uh, but really, you know, I, I, I'd rather see Hush <laughs> in German uh, when it comes out in America. I mean, we get the the movies that appear. I mean, our movies appear overseas sometimes even before they appear here. You can go to Tokyo and find a. The Avengers before they it appears here. Why is that distribution system so much better and comic books fall behind like that? It just seems to me that, that people in all over, all around the world are hot for our comic books. They should be getting them when we get them. I, I don't I don't quite understand it. I hope it improves. Um, the common sense is that everybody should read them at the same time because we really have an international fandom. I mean the people the people who read comic books in, in Sicily, believe me, they're no different than people who read comics in New York or California or in, in the Midwest. They're exactly the same. They know what's going on. And they're just, they just whine a little bit because they can't get the books as early as we get them here in the United States. It doesn't, really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I hope that that changes. Same thing with TV. You mean it, it appears later? Yeah, yeah, they said that they wouldn't see Big Bang's finale for a year. That's right. The actor on Big Bang, Galecki, he was at the convention. And of course, the show has ended here, but it's still got a year to go in Europe. So he's as he's as hot a product as you could possibly get, and, and, and everybody was delighted to have him there. And, and of course, he was as intellectual as he seems on the show. He was, I mean, he went out at night until 4 o'clock in the morning walking all over the city looking at the old buildings and smart guy. And uh, he was a big, big hit at the show. Speaking of books and signings, tell us a little bit more about the L.A. store. Well, the L.A. store, okay, you guys, you guys have already heard about the L.A. store. It's on Magnolia between Pass and Coenga. It used to be our studio, and our, the question was, do we sell half the building or do we rent it? Uh, because we have very big building, it's, uh, it's over 4,000 square feet. And so the question was, you know, we could rent it because we were no longer doing that work. I'm back doing comic books. And I thought, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't think I want to do that. What can we do with that building? What about we have a comic book store? And once it hit me, I realized it was so obvious. And then the question, of course, then hit me was, what do I know about comic book stores? Well, I don't know anything about comic book stores. I have been asking questions for months now. I have been begging people for help. I've been, I've been uh, all over the place uh, talking to store owners, asking them, how, how, how many times can I be stupid uh, doing this store? And they told me I could be stupid a whole lot. And in all these categories, you know, distri distribution, uh, ordering too many comics, ordering the wrong kind of comic books, or the wrong kind of comics for your neighborhood. Then I realized, you know what? I'm going to get all this advice from all these wonderful people, and they're going to guide me, and they're going to hold my hand, and they're going to let me do some of the things I want to do that, are, that have nothing to do with what necessarily what they're interested in doing. But in L.A., like in New York, there's a community of stores. There's eight stores in L.A. We are the ninth store. Okay. So I don't want my store to be like everybody else's store. So, yeah, we do pulls. You know what pulls are, right? Where you pull comic books for people. Then we have art books. Okay. Why do we have art books? Because I, I know that the artists, whether they're in L.A. or across the country, have, have to study the history of art to know what the potential is for them to do. For example, Austin Briggs. For example, Bob Peak. For example, Norman Rockwell. There's so many artists that we need to see the work of, and you don't get to see it because guess what? 
it goes on Amazon. It gets sold right away. People don't really care about about art books. You know, you see art books stacked up in bookstores. Remember when we used to have bookstores, and they would the the prices would go down, and it would be, I don't know, a frustrated waste of time uh, to get to get young artists to pay attention to the new artists. Well, what we're going to do in the stores, we're going to load up with some of the best artists of the last hundred years, from Alphonse Mucha to Norman Rockwell. To to Drew Struzan, even some comic book artists. So we're going to have that section. We're going to have a section for women. And I don't mean for women like I pick what's for women. Women pick what's for women. They decide what they want. It could be for guys and be for women. We're also going to have a section for kids. So that when they come in with dad on Saturday, they have stuff that they can get. And their wives have something for them to get. So they can all go to the comic book store together. Of course, we're going to have manga. We're going to have a gallery. We're going to have games. We're going to have everything because we've got over 4,000 square feet. And it belongs to me, and I am the nicest landlord. I am so nice as a landlord, so liberal. We're building in there. We're putting in nice wood floors. The walls are white. I mean, it's pretty and light and fun and, and comfortable. And everybody seems to like it. I mean, you know, we're getting reviews. People seem to think it's a nice, a nice store. But more than that, it's not in competition with the other stores. We're not doing a comic book store that's fighting the other stores. We're saying, okay, yeah, we'll carry comic books, but we'll also carry art books. I mean, I really want, pe I really want people to read the Prince Valiant series uh, that are out there in book form. I, I really want people to look at Austin Briggs and all these guys. I want people to be comfortable. Yeah, they can get the toys, but there's also, we also have art on the walls for sale from different artists, so, including myself. And anyway, now we're not in a great neighborhood. I mean, I, Magnolia is a, is a good neighborhood. You, there's no big parking lots anywhere, so you kind of have to park on the side streets just like everybody else. But it's comfortable, and it's a nice neighborhood, and it's every, everybody's happy there. And, and I'm not, we're not making a big deal. We're just making, it's just a lot of space with a lot of books and a lot of fun and a lot of relaxation. We had a soft opening with Bill Sienkiewicz and John Bogdanoff. They had a terrific time, or at least they told me they had a terrific time. They were there for hours. The people loved them. Uh, the people were, were delighted to be able to talk to them and, and, and interact with them. And ever since, I, ever since then, I've been talking to other artists. And anybody who's in the L.A. area wants to come over and, and see the store and appear at the store and do sketches and whatever. Uh, I did a, a, an afternoon. Uh, we're going to have uh, on the Saturday before San Diego, we're going to have uh, uh, another opening, a hard opening, and uh, my son Joel is going to be there, and Buzz is going to be there, I'm going to be there, and we're going to see if we can get a couple of other people there. We haven't really announced anything yet. We're talking to people, and we're going to have a really good time. The whole point is that, of course, that we're doing a comic book store that I'd like to go into. I want to see art books. I want to see statues. I want to see some of the best statuary that's out there. So I'm going to make it my business to see that that stuff's there. There's so many young artists in New York and L.A. There's so, many, there's so many places for artists to be, to do their work. There's Disney. There's uh, the two art colleges. There's um, uh, the, the cartoon networks. They're all out there. Everybody's out there. Even D.C. is out there. And, you know, we want these people. There's, there's directors who, who wanted to become artists when they were young, and then they became directors who want to come to a store like this. And I'm sure there are stores that they go to. And we want this to be another one. We're not doing anything to compete with the other stores. We're not pricing things low or anything like that. We're pricing things normally. And we want people to come and have a good time because I'm already having a good time. I get to spend my time out there when I go to LA at my store. It's cool. Fantastic. Yes, it is Thank fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for joining you. us today. See you next time. I'm going to be doing reports on these conventions uh, here and there, on and off, not every week, perhaps, but, you know, to let you know uh, where to go and what to do if you're going to conventions around the world. This one is a particularly good one. Don't expect the economy to be fantastic, but expect the people to be utterly fantastic. You just can't be Italians. I'm telling you.